Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my review of the 1993 drama thriller Falling Down. Now, before I get around to sharing more of my thoughts on this film, I want to give a special shout out to John for requesting this review. And if there's another film, TV show, or topic that you would like to see me discuss in the future, feel free to donate to my PayPal. The link will be in the video description down below, and I'll try to get to it as soon as I possibly can. Now, Falling Down is honestly one of my all-time favorite films. This would probably at least crack my top 150 if I was to ever make a list like that. I think it's one of the finest dramatic thrillers out there and definitely one of the best films of the 90s. And it's a movie that just carries more and more weight each time that I watch it. It just gets better. I notice more things. I, I pick up on the subtext more. And it's a movie that, to me, it resonated strongly back in 1993. And it resonates just as strongly now. Because a lot of the themes, a lot of the subtext, a lot of the uh, elements when it comes to this film, film's narrative and how it, it uh, details society are still very relevant today. The film is directed by Joel Schumacher, and I think Schumacher did a spectacular job with this film. He did such a phenomenal job just capturing what it would feel like to be in the shoes of defense or to be a part of this setting, which is a sweltering Los Angeles in the middle of the summer. And almost to the point where every frame looks like it's bubbling under the surface. And it's one of the best examples of a film that visually matches the mindset and the psyche of its protagonist or its lead. And just from the opening sequence where Defends is in his car and it's a, it's just a, a hellish situation because of this just hellacious traffic jam and it's like hundreds, a hundred degrees outside or more and he's just sweating and there's a fly in the car and there's just all this cacophony of noise and other people that are not happy with the traffic jam and just the way that he uses shots that include like extreme close-ups, uh, pans, uh, all different types of angles, just to really create a very discombobulating and disorientating visual tone. And it's just a great way to start the film, it really puts you in the shoes of Defends in a very effective fashion. And then as the film goes on, once he starts his journey, it, it still does equally as good of a job visually just maintaining that feel while also doing other things. I think Schumacher really made Los Angeles, at least these certain portions of uh, the city, feel like they are their own character when it comes to the graffiti on the on the. Uh, the alleys or, or on some of the walls or some of the buildings or, or even on the street, uh, as well as a lot of these other sort of different um, aspects visually when it comes to really just bringing the most out of a location. And he got the most out of his actors. I mean, everyone in this, even people who are doing small cameo roles, deliver just really great performances it's just one of those things where this is a project, this is a film that easily could have just spiraled out of control with the wrong director and the wrong person at the head of it all. And Schumacher had a definitive passion for this project. He loved this script by Ebby Rose Smith, and he really wanted to make this movie. And it really does show. It shows in every frame that Schumacher just felt like this is a film that was going to be great and that he was the right person to, to really bring it to the screen. 
And that just carried over with the performances, with the work of the cinematographer, the editor, and just everyone else involved with the production. It just just became kind of a cascading sort of waterfall effect where Schumacher's approach and just just excellent uh, um, view and um, attention to detail just really carried over throughout every aspect of the film's production. And when people think about Schumacher, this is one of the films that comes to mind immediately for me. It's not Batman and Robin. It's not Batman Forever. It's falling down. And I think this is easily one of his best films when it comes to the direction. It showcases how talented of a filmmaker he is on no, numerous different levels when it comes to the film's uh, use of angles and different uh, camera techniques and point of view shots and just uh, zooms and pans and, and establishing shots and all these different things. It just showcases just how brilliant he was in his prime when it comes to the visual medium, when it comes to film, just creating just such a really great, consistent visual tone. And as good of a job as Joel Schumacher does directing this film, Falling Down would not be as fantastic as it is without the screenplay by Ebby Rowe Smith. Now, the script for a while, even years before this film ultimately got made, it was considered to be one of the best scripts that was circulating throughout Hollywood. But because of its subject matter, because of its controversial nature, studios continuously turned it down. Even though they thought it was a well-written script and they thought it had potential, they just didn't want to light off that powder keg. And it really wasn't until like Joel Schumacher started to really champion for the film and Michael Douglas, uh, once he got a hold of the script and, and read it and loved it and wanted to do the film, that's one when the, the ball really started to get rolling when it comes to the movie coming to the screen. And I just can't think of a world where we don't have this movie. Uh, that would be the world would definitely not be as good when it comes to the realm of cinema without falling down because it's just to me it's like the quintessential film when it comes to uh, a man or a or just a person in general who is broken by society and decides to retaliate against these broken parts of society with violence and the reason why i think it's the quintessential take on that compared to other uh films like joker or so on and so forth is that there is a certain sense of sympathy that you have for defends that makes him a very tragic character he's someone that you feel for and you sympathize with despite the things that he ultimately does you feel for him because of the fact that he lost his job due to circumstances out of his control he worked as a defense contractor and it came to a, a time where the government decided we don't need you anymore. We don't, we, you know, you did all this work for us. You helped build missiles, but we don't need to build as, th these missiles as much anymore. And so we don't need you. And that was Bill's identity. That was something that he could cling on to. And as a man who was also struggling with mental illness, that was just too much for him to take. And he snapped and he snapped to the point where he's going and getting in his car and taking a briefcase and dressing it up in his work clothes and getting ready. Like he's going to work. He's going through traffic, but he's been out of a job for a month or more. And so, yeah, this is a man on the edge and he snaps and this is a visual showcase of a man's mental breakdown and him 
just retaliating against these fallen and broken and just deteriorating parts of society. And I think it's a masterclass in subtext as well. I think this film should be studied when it comes to a script by Evie Rowe Smith. I think it should be studied by uh, scholars and professors in film schools to showcase how you do a film that has plenty of subtext, has a lot of things when it comes to its discussions about society, and does it in a way that doesn't completely, totally alienate a wide audience. It does it in a way that isn't pretentious. It does it in a way that still provides engaging, strong characters coupled with a consistent and captivating story and narrative. It shows that subtext is at its best when it's under the surface, when it's just bubbling or it's just right there and simmering. And I, I think that really is where subtext should be. That's why it's called subtext. So many filmmakers, so many writers today, they really could learn from falling down when it comes to making a movie that has something to say about society, but that's not the only thing that it has to say. And I think there's so many films that just miss this entirely. And they write screenplays that are essentially essays about some aspect of society, but they forget to write engaging characters. They forget to write a narrative or a plot that is consistently strong and intriguing. They just think the subtext by itself can be the main text or the main drawing uh, power. And that's just, that's just not the case. Yeah, just the way that it talks about society is so ahead of its time. And I think it just is a film that just continues to resonate every bit as well as it did back in 1993 because of, you know, the same sort of stuff where people feel like they are being phased out or where there's a lot of people who feel that they're no longer economically viable, the dissolution of the middle class, the uh, various different issues that people face uh, when it comes to mental illness or when it comes to uh, just not being able to be a part of the workforce, not being able to provide for themselves or their families. And just showcasing all these different gray areas and moral, vague aspects of society in a way that really does speak to you. And yeah, I just love the way that this script is. It just handles all aspects of society, all, all of these different parts of this story, all these different characters, the, the shop owners, defends his wife, the police, uh, the, the city and the various different people living in it or working in the city. And it just showcases all these different gray areas when it comes to, uh, how society as a whole is interpreted throughout the lens of this film and this, this film's narrative. It's more realistic. It's more raw. It's more gritty. It actually feels closer to reality, despite some of the things that Defense does that most people would never do, like blow up the street with a rocket launcher because they want to show the city that, that it's messed up, that you're spending all this money tearing up a street that works perfectly fine just so you can spend the money on uh, the, the budget. Why not use that and fix a street that actually is broken? And so there's a lot of stuff that happens in this film when it comes to defense and his rampage that people can relate to. Like, why, why do we have all these golf courses and, and private clubs that are cost 
so much money and take up so much space in in our cities when you could use that as a park or some sort of way or place for for kids or families to play in or maybe even a a place where people could use to to live to sleep well you could have some of the homeless people who are without a home they could have more uh, maybe a shelter there instead of some golf course where all these old farts play golf it's just one of those things where it just does a great job showcasing these these little these, these little moral gray areas and, and just really speaking to people and while still not necessarily painting defends as a hero well you have that whole scene near the end where he's like i'm the bad guy I, how did that happen you know it, 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 it it's it's like he is so deluded that he thinks that he is the hero and that's the whole point like he's so deluded and out of his mind at this point that he feels that he's in the right despite all the chaos and despite all the carnage that he's causing I mean that's why you have that scene with the uh neo nazi guy at the at the um the the um military goods store and how the neo nazi guy he's inspired by what defense is doing and he thinks he's doing uh the kind of work that he believes in and he thinks that they're one and the same and that's where you have the moment where defense actually kills a guy because he, he he just wants to kill that part of him, that part that people might see in him by his actions. He wants to just showcase, no, there's no way. No, I'm not like that. I'm not like you. And in order him for him to really just separate himself from that, he kills the guy. But also, it's an act of self-defense. You could argue it that way, because if he didn't, like, who knows what that guy would have done. But yeah, it's not just defense when it comes to showcasing these gray areas of society. Like, it's also um, the police department and how you how it showcases that you could have a guy like Pendergrass who's just doing his job and does a good job. He's a good cop, but because he doesn't do his job in a way that his boss or his superior or other cops feel is the best way to do it. He's considered not nearly as good of a police officer. He's getting mocked for it. He's getting, uh, just completely just railed on for not being a foul mouthed cop, which is crazy, right? His superior gets on his case because he doesn't ever say the word fuck. Which then leads to a great moment where he cusses out his, uh, his, his, uh, his superior on live television. But yeah, there's just a lot of different layers to this script that are just amazing. They're just great. And I even like the gray areas that it talks about when it comes to defense and his wife and their relationship. How it shows some home movies that show what his wife saw when it comes to his potential to commit violence or why she decided to get a restraining order. But why, But also showcasing that she kind of jumped the gun. That she wasn't necessarily in the right when it comes to deciding right then and there after he was a little too aggressive with his daughter trying to get her to get on a horsey that oh we're gonna break up i'm gonna divorce you i'm gonna take your daughter away and i'm gonna get a restraining order as well that's why you have like that scene where the cop is even like did he ever do anything and then she was like no but but i think he could have and it just makes you really think you're like, well, maybe he could have been rehabilitated. Like maybe if his wife tried or tried harder or made more of an effort to maybe get him to get some help to go to therapy, um, maybe work 
some of the things out that, that's going on in his head that maybe he could maybe get him on, get him on some meds or something. Maybe he could have been rehabilitated. Maybe this rampage would have never happened. Maybe his daughter would still have her father in her life, but she just decided, Oh, he's too aggressive. I think he could hurt my daughter. I think he could hurt me. So it's done. It's over. It's almost like she didn't even give him a chance. Didn't even give him a second chance once he was starting to show cracks. And that's a very realistic part of society as well. And a part of relationships. Because there's a lot of people that that would be their reaction. Their immediate reaction would be to separate. To distance themselves from that person. Because they don't want to deal with it. And they're also afraid that it could escalate. And it's understandable because of all these other forms of media, all these other things that people have seen in the news when it comes to a spouse who snapped. So it's understandable that they would have that reaction. But I still don't feel, especially when it comes to mental illness, that the best approach is to just cut that person off. And cut that person completely out of your life. Especially if you haven't even tried to maybe see if they would be willing to get some help for their mental issues. And if they aren't willing to get help, that's one thing. If you made the effort and things didn't work, that's another. And then that's fine. A separation, a straining order, all this other stuff makes perfect sense. But... When it comes to the way that Ebby Rose Smith writes the dynamic between Bill and his wife, there is nothing that says that she made that effort, that she tried. And so that just adds another tragic layer to everything that happens in this film and to the end of the movie where he pulls out the squirt gun in a duel with Pendergrast and he dies. When really he just wanted to go home and he just wanted to be with his daughter. Maybe none of this violence would have ever happened if he could have just been allowed to rehabilitate, re rehabilitate himself, given that chance. So when he fell down, he would have somebody to help him get back up. But he had no one. So yeah, just, just a really, really strong screenplay when it comes to just so many different elements from the main plot, the main arc with Defends, and how his rampage just escalates continually throughout the movie. It's brilliant use of dark humor. Yeah, you're going to die. You're going to die wearing that stupid, silly little hat. Uh, You know, stuff like that. And... Just a lot of different dynamics that are going on throughout the movie. What's happening with Pendergrast and him when he's on what might be his last day as a cop and dealing with his wife and her problems and him eventually getting his balls back and telling her to shut up and listen to him and getting her to kind of snap out of it. And at the same time, like, regaining his confidence in, in himself. So you have that going on while Michael Douglas's character defends is having his whole rampage, doing the whole stuff with the burger joint and pointing out things that we all wish we could, but we never wouldn't have the balls to do. And, you know, shooting up the, the phone booth when the guy was being a jerk who, who was just really just berating uh, Defense and getting on him because he wouldn't, you know, get off the phone. And just all this sort of stuff that just culminates and just ends in, in just a really gripping, powerful way when Defense falls down, falls off the pier to his death. Uh, it, like even the last shots of the film are just little bits of that home uh, video footage 
when Bill was happier, when he was with his wife, when he was with his kid, prior to him losing his job, losing everything, and and even losing his sanity. And I can't talk about this film without talking about the cast. I mean, Michael Douglas is just magnificent as Bill defends. I think it's honestly his best performance. And even Douglas agrees. Like, Douglas himself feels that this is his best acting role in anything. Uh, I mean, I don't know why he wasn't nominated for an Oscar for this. Robbed of an Oscar nomination. Because this performance is just that good. It's a performance that is just consistently engaging, gripping, and powerful. You can't take your eyes off of Douglas uh when it comes to this movie from the opening frame to even when he's just having his freak out at the uh, convenience store because he just wants to get, he just wants to get enough money for a phone call. And the guy, he's a stickler for the price and defense feels that the price is outrageous and he just snaps and busts up the store and takes the Coke and, Gets the mud, gets the change out of the register, but he doesn't steal anything. He doesn't attack the guy who's owning the shop. He just beats the shit out of all of his shelves, but he still pays for the, the drink, but he pays what he thinks he should be paying for the drink. And then that just, 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 it's just the start of everything. And he just becomes a very enigmatic and just charismatic character despite the fact that he's just such a broken man. The man is nuts. He's off his rocker. But there's just something about Douglas's portrayal of the character that just makes him both sympathetic and entertaining to watch, despite what he's doing, uh, despite the fact that he's a, a man who is just completely off the deep end. And... You also have Robert Duvall as as Pendergrast uh, or Pendergast. Sorry, I probably said it wrong for most of the video. My apologies. But yeah, Robert Duvall, who is just great in this. One of his best performances. I love his performance as this cop who's trying the best he can to make it through what could be his last day as a cop because... He's retiring early because he's doing it for his wife who's been through a tough time and he's also going through a lot in terms of really just not really feeling like himself. And so throughout this whole film and this investigation and trying to find the guy in in the glasses and the tie who's, who's doing all this crazy stuff and going on this rampage, he finds himself. He, he he regains confidence in himself and his abilities and he decides, nah, I'm not going to retire. It's too early for that. I'm a damn good cop. I'm going to keep being a damn good cop. And you know, my wife, you know, God bless her. She's dealing with a lot of stuff, but I'm not going to sacrifice my career and everything for just to make her happy. And, you know, I, I think there's something to be said about that. And yeah, Duvall is just great. I even like his little snide, little sense of humor that he has. And I think him and Rachel Tickleton, who plays Sandra Torres, like they have just great chemistry. They were so good together. I honestly wish they were maybe in it a little bit more. Uh, Barbara Hershey, she's really solid as Beth, uh, Bill's ex-wife. And it's one of those things where She's not in the film a lot, and I can see why some people find her to be not as sympathetic because of the way that she's portrayed and the way that her character is written, but I still think she makes it work. You still definitely do feel that at one point she genuinely did love Bill, and that's what makes it so much more frustrating that it seems like she didn't make as much of an effort to try to you know, save the relationship or save Bill, and... But you also do understand why she feels the way that she does because of this footage that you see that he's just 
overly aggressive with with uh, their daughter and to the even when she's telling him to stop and you know the daughter doesn't want to get on the horse he's still adamant about it and you could see that maybe that could turn into something that would potentially be abusive so you can see her perspective that maybe she felt like oh I got to get out of this while I can early before anything happens to me or my daughter because there's a lot of instances in reality where the bad things do happen because they stay in that relationship so you you do have a certain amount of sympathy for her and I, I do feel it's a good performance even though she was only in a little bit you definitely did see the emotion you definitely did feel something for Beth and what happened to her relationship with Bill and what's happening right now and how that's affecting her and her daughter. Uh, Tuesday Weld, I liked her performance too. I thought she was terrific as Amanda. She was totally just a an, an total nag, but she did a great job playing that kind of character and uh, also had some nice chemistry with uh, Robert Duvall. Uh, uh, there are a few other people you know, like Lois Smith, who plays Foster's mother, thought she did a nice job in her small role. Um, Michael Paul Chan as Mr. Lee, the shop owner. Um, a lot of just really small roles that really do uh, stand out. Um, the guy who plays the 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 white supremacist neo-nazi who uh operates the uh, the military supply store I'm, I'm looking up that guy because that that was a really really good performance like the character yeah frederick forrest played the surplus store owner like the the surplus store store owner guy he was such a piece of shit like an awful fucking person but the way that frederick forrest played that character there was something just so charismatic about that performance. Like you just, it was captivating in its own just depraved, crazy way. And it made the very just disgusting subject matter in a lot of ways when it comes to his infatuation, just obsession with Nazis and, and Hitler and, and how, how he's beaming about having this can that was used to kill all these Jews because it, it contained the gas that killed the Jews. And it's just a really good performance. Like you're very drawn into that scene because it's just how far and, and just how deep uh, Frederick goes into that role. And this is a movie that even has like just memorable performances from a, a, a actor in Vondi Curtis Hall who's only in this film for like maybe two minutes he plays the not economically viable man the African-American man who's out uh, uh, in front of the bank and he's doing a peaceful protest and he's talking about how he, he's no longer economically viable you know this is what happens this is what happens folks when you're not economically viable and he's talking about how we tried to go into the bank and get a loan and they refused the loan. And he says he's been at that bank for many, many years and they just decided that he was economically uh, not viable. Like they, they just felt like even though he had been a customer with that bank for many, many years, they decided he was the one that was not economically viable enough for a loan and so the guy just has has a mental breakdown he need probably need the loan to try to make ends meet and he doesn't get it he's he's uh it, all, it almost seems like he's also maybe without a job and there's just something so powerful about that scene and in, in large part it's due to the performance by Vondi curtis hall uh, you really do just feel for the guy and that whole scene where he, he looks at uh, uh, defends and other people on the street and says, you know, remember me. 
that, that there's just a way that he just plays that role that's just so powerful and 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 just tragic and poignant in its own way so yeah just a really really strong just powerhouse cast and what's interesting is there were a lot of people that were considered to be the two main uh actors in this uh defends and pendergast so michael douglas was joel schumacher's first choice from the very beginning but Jack Nicholson, Ed Harris, Robert De Niro, Alec Baldwin, Jeff Bridges, Nick Nolte, Mel Gibson, Michael Keaton, Robin Williams, Harrison Ford, Dustin Hoffman, and Al Pacino, they were all considered at one point to maybe play defense. And, and honestly, most of them would probably have done a good job. I don't know about Harrison Ford. I think Keaton would have nailed it because he's just so great at playing these kind of roles anyway. Ed Harris. Would have been really good. Um, Robin Williams would have been interesting. Because this was at the point in his career where he did some dramatic stuff. But he was more, you know, the com- he was doing the comedy stuff. And that really would have been an interesting thing to see Robin Williams tackle uh, the defense role. And what he, what he would bring to it. And going to Pendergast... Or Prendergast, just I don't know why I can't say the guy's name properly. But you had Gene Hackman, Walter Matthau, Sidney Poitier, Paul Newman, Jason Robards, and Jack Lemon, and all of them would have been great. Uh, Gene Hackman in particular, that would have been really cool to see, like Gene Hackman, you know, versus Michael Douglas. But uh, Robert Duvall was 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 so good, so. Uh, I, I honestly feel Robert Duvall was great enough that, yeah, Gene Hackman would have been really good, but Duvall just did such a good job with the character and made it his own that I can't really see anyone else playing the role. And I feel the same way about Michael Douglas, even though I do have a certain sense of curiosity for some of these actors, these other actors playing this character, but it's Michael Douglas all the way. I mean... Douglas did such a great job with this performance that even his own father, Kirk Douglas, felt that this was the best role that he ever saw his son do. And yeah, it's a, it's a well shot film when it comes to cinematography by Andres uh, Bartowiak. Uh, the cinematography just perfectly blends with what Joel Schumacher's vision for the film is. The tone for the film that's just constantly feeling like there's just some kind of heat that's under every frame and it's it's getting ready to just boil over or just burn through the film and and just light itself on fire the editing by paul hirsch also perfectly ties into all of these other visual elements of the movie uh, the emotions that are that are present in it through the characters and the interactions with other people or with the location or with just society in general. Uh, the music by James Newton Howard, it also really uh, elevates a lot of these elements, just creates an even bigger and more powerful powder keg uh, of a motion picture. And it's a movie that's like 113 minutes, but it never drags. It never feels like it's boring. It never feels like it's wasting your time. It's just consistently thrilling and thrilling, engaging, and it's just a, just such an engrossing film. Like you just, from the moment it starts, you just can't take your eyes off of it. To me, it's a classic. Uh, I cannot recommend it enough if you haven't checked it out. And uh, yeah, uh, thanks for watching my review. And as always, I'll see you later. See ya.